It's just Bruce, he don't bite. <laughs> Hello. Hey folks, welcome to my kitchen once again. My name is Bruce and today we're gonna teach you how to make chicken fried steak and a gravy to go with it. Uh, I just wanna give you a little background on myself. People ask me where I come from, what I've done. I've been cooking my whole life, ever since I was 16 years old. I had a little job in a mall called, it was a little restaurant called Soup and Sandwich, which is probably why I love cooking soups, which we're not doing a soup today, but I have just fell in love with cooking for people and learning. And I've worked all over the country. I've worked uh, in uh, uh, Ohio. I lived in Cincinnati for a while. I worked in a hotel there, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Sandusky, Ohio, Toledo, uh, just just to name a few. Uh, I've been cooking basically 35 years. And uh, the reason I do it is I love to cook and I love to learn. And I uh, do. I am. You know, I went to culinary school way way back in the day. Yes, they had culinary school back then. Just want to give you a little background on what's going on. Uh, Chicken fried steak is a southern dish. I learned how to cook it down in Kentucky. I made a few of my own little modifications to it. Uh, my daughter was over, oh, about a month ago. I had two daughters. They were over about a month ago, and I'm, I made chicken fried steak. And my one daughter turned her nose up. She, she thought it was gross until she took a taste. She ate the whole thing. She loved it. So then her birthday came around. I said, her name is Vicky. I said, Vicky, I said, what do, you want, what do you want for your birthday? I'll cook you dinner. I'll cook you anything you want. Uh, I made her off to take her out. She's like, no, Dad, I really want you to cook that chicken fried steak. I'm like, I was a little surprised because I saw her face when she was here the first time. Turns out she really liked it, so I made that. And, uh, well, that's what I'm going to go over today. I'm going to teach you how to make that dish. It's, uh, it's easy. You can make it at home. Showing you the home version. I got my own little modification twist on it, which I'll explain later. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, of course, to start this, you're going to need a good cut of meat. This is actually bottom round and is bought at the grocery store today with $6.99 a pound. It's already been pre-processed. If you can see, it's got the uh, cuttings in it where they've already tenderized it and they ran it to the machine to cut it up nice for us. Um, if you can't find this in the grocery store already prepared like this, you can get bottom round. And bottom round, it won't be processed like this, but I'm going to show you how you can quickly do that. Basically, you're going to take your bottom round steak, you're going to lay it out nice and flat. And you need a mallet. This mallet, you see one has a smooth side and one has like a prickly side. I hope you can see that in the camera there. And you're basically just going to beat the snot out of it like this. And what you're doing, what you're doing when you do that, if you see even just hitting this one, it's poking holes and it's flattening it more. So we want to get this down about a quarter inch thick. You don't have to do this if it's already prepared. I'm just demonstrating. But now you can see it's got all the holes in there and all the puncture marks. That's where the seasoning is going to go in. And our buttermilk is going to go in and help keep it tender. We'll do the other side real quick. And as you can see, it's, it did spread this out a little bit more than it already was. And now uh, we are going to soak this in the buttermilk mixture, which I'm going to show you next. As you can see, I'm going to start here with two eggs. And I put the eggs in the pan first, just in case, because that's the only opportunity I'm really going to get to pick out any shells, in case I drop some shells. We're just going to break those up a little bit. Just break them up. And then we're going to add two cups of fresh buttermilk. I've already had to measure it out. That's two cups, give or take a little bit. Doesn't have to be exact. And we're just going to mix that up. Get it well blended in there. You don't have to whip the heck out of it. Just get it mixed up. So you can see the egg has been dissolved. You can see I got some here in the got some here in the table. And then this is the this is the uh, this is my spice mix, which I'm just going to put a couple dashes in there for a little bit of flavor. I'll explain to you what's in that whenever we do get to the flour. And then my paper tails are attacking me. And uh, that's all you got to do for the buttermilk mixture. And then you're going then we're going to take our steaks. As you can see, I pounded out the other two just to make them look nicer. And we're just going to marinate them in there for about, oh, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Make sure they're covered. And we're just going to let that sit for about 15, 20 minutes. Um, you can put them in a the refrigerator, but if you're going to cook them right away, just leave them sit for like 15, 20 minutes, and you're good to go on that. So I wanted to explain this spice mix real quick. Every chef I know has their own blend of spices they like to pre-make. It makes it easier, especially if you're cooking in a high volume restaurant or uh, you just want to have a lane around to use so you don't have to sit there and get a teaspoon of this, teaspoon of that, teaspoon of this. Um, this is mine. There's no name for it. It's just my own little herb recipe. 
Uh, I just want to go over real quick what's in it, if you want to make it for home. Um, what's in it, and I've got a cheat sheet here I'm going to stare at. It, equal parts, so like, I think I used tablespoons. Yeah, I used, when I made this, I used tablespoons. So equal parts of paprika, salt, garlic powder, black pepper, onion powder, cayenne pepper, oregano, and thyme. That's all that's in this. And I use this in almost everything. You can put it on a steak. I use it in all my fried batters. I do a lot of fried, fried cooking. Um, no wonder I'm a little chubby. But uh, you can use this on almost anything. Steak, fish, chicken, pork. And it just really just adds some great flavor. It's nothing super fancy. I'm not going to be marketing it. So just like I said, equal parts of the spices I just mentioned. If you didn't hear it, you can rewind and hear that. I just want to take a quick note because in the recipe you can see I'm not telling you everything that I'm putting in there. But it's right here. That's everything here plus a little extra black pepper I used. But anyway, continuing. So for our flour mixture, I've got two cups of flour in here now. And I'm going to put a little bit of my seasoning mix. Like I said, you can, I, I've ever, I think I've already explained what's in this, but I'm going to put a little bit in there. I want to be kind of generous with it. So whenever I mix it up, I'll see the seasoning mixed all in with the flour. And not only do you want to put seasoning mix in there, this is most important. You want to use baking powder. This is what gives it the different crispiness. Um, up until now, this has just been a generic recipe that a lot of people use. I'm going to put about a tablespoon of baking powder in there. And what that's going to do, it's going to cause a chemical reaction with the steaks and the egg in the egg and buttermilk in the wet mixture. And it's going to make this rise up and be extra crispy when we're done. So we're just going to mix that up. And then on to the breading and the cooking. One thing I forgot to mention on the breading, or the, the making this flour, after you mix it, take about three or four tablespoons out and set it aside. We're going to use that to thicken up our gravy. So don't forget to do that. If you do forget to do it, that's okay. You can always just take fresh flour and add some seasonings to it. But I like to take it out at this point. So now our steaks have been marinating there about 20 minutes, like I was saying. And uh, we're ready to do the breading. And uh, I'm going to show you how to do that. But first I was looking at this and I decided, that's my flour mixture, I decided I want to put some more pepper in there. So I'm going to put another on another tablespoon of pepper in there. This pepper is basically the main the main spice you want to use on this kind of a meal for the steak. So I just wanted to get a little more pepper in there and make it make it a little tastier. So then what we're gonna do we got our steaks and our buttermilk and if you can see the holes and stuff are actually holding that buttermilk in there. We're just gonna shake a little buttermilk off. We're gonna put it in the flour cover good flip it over Let's give it a nice dusting flour in there and see this, the uh, moisture holding the flour to the steak. But we're also going to do a double dip. So I'm going back into my buttermilk on top of that flour. Let it drizzle off. Back into my flour once more. Some people use their hands. I mean, you might have to get in there with your hands because you want to, this last coat, you want to, I'm going to pat it down. You want to pat it down with your hand. Make sure it's really holding all that flour on there. And as you can see, I get it all over my hands. So make sure your hands are clean, and you will be washing your hands a lot making this. So look look how much bigger that steak looks just with that, that breading on there. We're going to set that in this cooling rack over here. And we're going to let that soak in for a little while, about another 10 minutes. And what that will do is that will activate that baking powder. So when I go to uh, fry it up, it will make my, my breading much more puffier and crispier. Now I'm going to go ahead and do these last two and we're gonna let this sit for 10 minutes I'll fast forward now okay now I'm gonna wash my hands and we'll go on to the next step So here's what they look like now, now that they're in the, the, the drying rack. And like I said, I'm going to leave that sit for maybe 10-15 minutes. You could go ahead and fry them right now if you wanted to. But as you can see, I don't have my oil ready or anything. So that, that'll give me time to get my oil ready. And then uh, next step, we're going to fry these up. And give me 10 minutes. So now's where the fun begins. We're going to cook these up. 
Um, as you can see, I'm using my trusty iron skillet. It's one of my favorite tools in the kitchen to use. I cook almost everything at home in an iron skillet. I mean, I even have a video on there teaching how to make a pizza in an iron skillet. And it's, it's great. You should check it out. It's uh, somewhere else on my channel. Um, so what I'm doing here is I got some canola oil in the bottom of my pan. It's about a half an inch deep. And uh, I want to heat it up to 350. Now this is the thermometer I have. Unfortunately, this thermometer only goes up to 220. Now, and it, may, and it occurred to me, well, maybe these guys don't have thermometers at all. Maybe they're just, you know, winging it. So in that case, you can use a deep fryer to do this, or you can do what I'm about to show you to see if your oil's up to temperature or not. And all you got to do is just take a little bit of breading off your, uh, wherever, where you, if you save the flour, we're just going to drop it in there. And you can see there, it's sizzling, it's making a nice sizzle mark. That's about where we want to be. If the flour's not sizzling, your oil is not up to temperature. So this oil is up to temperature. So I'm going to, I guess I'm getting my hand dirty. Didn't mean to do that. I'm going to gently take one of these steaks. I'm going to lay it down in the oil, pushing it away from me because you don't want to splash yourself with the grease. Now this, I'm only going to do one this time. I could fit all three in here, but for this particular one, we're just going to do one just in case my oil is too hot. Because if my oil is too hot, it's going to, um, it's going to burn the outside and not cook the inside. And that's not what I want. So I have turned my heat down. I'm running at about a little, just a tad below medium on a gas stove. Uh, if you're using an electric stove, you're on your own. Let me wash my hands real quick here while I'm talking to you. And as you can see, it's sizzling. It looks to be about the right temperature. I might even have it a little bit high. I don't know. Well, we're going to find out together. It takes about four minutes to do this. So I'm going to fry it here for... Oh, about a minute and a half, and then I'm going to go ahead and try to flip it. And you, you can, if you can hear that nice sizzle sound, that's what you want to hear. That's just so you know it's cooking. It doesn't seem to be burning around the edges yet, so I think my temperature might be good. I'm lowering it just, just a little bit to make sure. Also, if you do do all three at the same time, when you put them in there, that will lower your oil temperature. So if you are able to use a thermometer, you want to set it at about 375 so you don't overcrowd the pan. But like I also said, if you don't want to go through the hassle of doing this and you have a deep fryer at home, set your deep fryer at 350 and throw the whole thing in there and you're good to go. So, okay, it's already looking like it's ready to flip, which means I'm sure that oil might have been a little bit hot. So I'm going to gently turn it, lay it down on the other side been in there about a minute. I flipped it a little early because I was anxious. Actually, it looks like my oil was not set too high. Otherwise, this will be all burnt. I think we're at a nice temperature. I just said, I'm maintaining about a medium, about a medium heat on my stove. And I'm going to go ahead and start these other two while that's cooking because there is room in the pan for it. And we'll see what we got. Like I said, lay it in any oil facing away from you so you don't splash yourself. And I'm going to go ahead and put the third one in too. I just wanted to make sure my oil wasn't too hot. So that's in there. And once again, I got stuff over my fingers. Keeping it down in the oil. Scooch this guy over a little bit. I'm going to wash my hand again. When you're making this kind of stuff, you always want to keep a lot of paper towels around it which I do have right here because you will get stuff in your fingers and you're going to have to wash them. I don't need this anymore. This was, in case anybody wondered what this is, this is actually just a crisping tray for my air fryer, but I'm using it as a cooling rack because you can see it's got a screen on there that holds it up from the bottom so it won't get your uh, product all soggy on the bottom. And we're going to do the same principle with a cooling rack when we pull these off. This is obviously, I don't have a cooling rack in my kitchen. This is another air fryer tray, but they work perfect. Actually, what I want to do is turn this upside down so it elevates more. So when I pull this out and put it on the tray, you're going to see. Now they seem to be firing up real nice. I'm actually turning my heat up just a little bit. Now I got it on full medium. And I'm going to fast forward this part.
Now I'm ready to flip these other two. And I actually flipped it a little bit early, so I'm going to leave that one stick. This guy, however, looks good. I'm pretty sure he's done. I'm going to set him on my drying rack over here. And I'm going to continue to work on these two. And it's been a few minutes, and I think these two actually came out better than the first one because it, I did have the oil just a tad too hot, which is why I put the biggest one in first. Take it off with oil drain, set it on my cooling rack. I'm going to kill the heat on my oil. And I just want to show you this up close, what they look like when they first come out. Now, if you look, see how much bigger they look than whenever I opened up the meat packet earlier and you saw me pounding them out. That's what that breading does. It makes it look bigger and it makes it a much more heartier meal. So a cheaper cut of meat can feed you more, basically. Now what I'm going to do with this now, I'm going to, I preheated my oven to 250 degrees. In fact, there, it just got done. I preheated my oven to 250 degrees. I'm going to put this in there to keep warm while we make the gravy. And next step is I'm going to show you how to make the gravy. For now, it's going in the warming oven. Okay, now we're going to move on to our gravy. I've got this pan out. Usually, when I make gravy, I got in the habit of using a soup pot, which is a little taller, or even a Dutch oven, just, just to keep from splashing. But so you guys can see what I'm doing today, I'm just using this, shit, this skillet. And what we're going to do, first we're going to melt four tablespoons of butter. I got this on about a medium heat. You don't want to burn the butter, so if you see it starting to sizzle too much, you're going to want to move that around, lift it off the heat. I just want to melt it. Now, butter has a pretty low burning temperature on heat, so you just want to melt it until you're ready to put the next ingredients in. What we're doing now is we're making, this is actually the thickening agent we're going to make first for our gravy. We're making a white gravy today. You can make any kind of gravy you want. I mean, this will go with a chicken gravy. This will go with a beef gravy, uh, southern brown gravy. Now, remember earlier I told you to save some flour from your uh, breading. And we're going to put that in there too. It's also four tablespoons. So you want equal amounts. If you want more gravy, use more butter and match it with your flour. And then all we're going to do is we're going to stir this around until it becomes a paste. It's called a roux. For those of you who didn't know that, this is what's going to give our gravy a nice thick body. But now we don't just want to stop now. You see everything melted together and it's a uh, like a jelly there on the bottom. You want to cook that flour a little bit in that butter. So every every granule of flour gets a little bit of fat around it. And you'll know when it's done whenever you start smelling like an almond, like a almond or even a pizza crust smell. Like what a cooked pizza crust smells like. But you want to keep it moving around like this. And it's actually a little quicker to do in a skillet, but I don't like the splash. So I'm just going to keep stirring this until I smell the aroma of pizza crust. And it's just about there. Yeah, that's going to be nice. I can smell it now. Okay, and I still have it on the medium heat. I'm going to start adding. I chose half and half today. Whipping cream is perfect. You can use, I'm just going to add a little bit at a time to mix it up. Whipping cream is perfect. I, I really would rather use whipping cream. But then when I saw the prices, I'm like, well, I'm just going to use half and half. You can use whole milk. You can use 2% milk, whatever you want. The procedure is still the same. You just want to incorporate that into your roux. And I really don't know the exact measurement on this. But as you can see now, I'm still way, way thick. That's way too thick to be gravy, right? Well, I just wanted to get that dissolved in there. Make sure your milk is cold. Some people say use it at room temperature. No, you want it cold. If you use cold, you will get you won't get any lumps. But if your if your milk's been sitting out at room temperature, you will get lumps. I know you're saying, "Hey, Bruce, I see lumps now." I'm still incorporating this mixture into my roux, so we're not even halfway done yet. But you can see it is starting to form a paste, a little thicker than gravy, and you see those lumps are breaking up. I'm gonna add a little more half and half. 
Some people like to add some chicken broth to this. If you want to add a little chicken broth in there for a little extra flavor, that's fine. But if you notice, the only seasoning we have in here is what was in our flour, which is that seasoning. And I should have taken a break and explained to you what's in that spice mix. It's uh, Every chef has his own spice mix. I'm, I probably said that. Okay, now we're starting to look like gravy. I'm going to add a little more. Like I said, still medium. I want this to be just a tad thin now. And we're going to let that cook down. While we're letting it cook down, the only ingredient I add to this gravy is a little bit of pepper. And when I say a little, I mean a lot. So that's about a tablespoon right there. For, for chicken fried steak, I like a peppery gravy. Now, like I said, there's other gravies you can use. If you look on my channel, you see I made, uh, I'm actually turning this up a little bit, but I'm going to keep stirring it so I don't scorch my milk. If you look on my channel, there's other, gra other gravies I've made. I made a sausage gravy and biscuit. The sausage gravy on the steak is so good. So give that a check out if you want to. But now I'm just going to let this cook for a little bit. It's still on just a, just a tad above medium. I'm going to try not to boil it. And that's going to thicken up in a little in a, in a minute here, which we will skip ahead to that. Okay, it's been about three minutes, and look at that nice thick gravy thickened up. I stirred it the whole time while I was standing here because I didn't want the milk to scorch. But it came out nice. If it comes out a little too thick, that's okay. You can add some more milk to it. You can add some chicken base to it. It's all what you feel like doing. And now, if you noticed, I didn't add any salt at all. That's because I never add salt till the very end because if you put too much salt in, you can't take it out. So we're going to do a little taste test here. Also, it should stick to the back of the spoon. If you can see that, it's sticking right to the back of that spoon. We're going to do a little taste test. Okay, that's not bad, but this is why I wait to the end to add salt. It also needs a little more pepper. Like I said, when you make this, is black pepper, by the way. If you really want to kick it up there, you can add a little bit of cayenne pepper to it. I normally do, but I'm cooking this for my wife, and she doesn't like cayenne pepper at all. But that's the good thing about this gravy. You can put anything in it you want. You can put garlic in there. You can put some onion, whatever your taste desires. What I'm showing you is just the base. So make it your own. And like I said, this needs some salt, which I happen to have some sea salt right here. You know what? Let's be fancy. I'm going to use the Himalayan sea salt. I don't know what that's so special, but right close. Different color. And man, that's probably about a teaspoon and a half of salt that I just added in there. And I always add it in late. It's a nice thick gravy. In fact, it might be a little too thick. Well, like I said, if it's too thick, that's okay. I'm going to pour a little more half and half in there. Just a little tiny bit. Thin that out. Takes a little practice to get the gravies right. But remember, if it comes out too thick, no problem. You can add more milk. You can add chicken base. Or chicken broth, excuse me. Um, I wouldn't go adding water to it. So that's about done. That means it's time for taster's time. And get the steaks out of the warming oven, and we shall have taste time. So I took my steak out of the warming oven. There it is on a plate. People were like, well, what can you serve with that? I like scrambled eggs with it. Country fried steak and scrambled eggs. Look, I'm just going to put some of that gravy on there. See how that gravy just flows on there? Today we're just going to do the steak, though, to show you. I'm sure everybody knows how to make scrambled eggs. Now it's time to taste it. Like I said, I, I like this with scrambled eggs on top of it. You can serve it with hash browns, mashed potatoes, corn. It's pretty much a steak. You can do whatever you want with it. But let's cut into this and see what we got. Cuts nice and crisp through that breading. Held together nice. It's got the breading all on each side. Nice and cooked through. You see the steak there? It's cooked probably about a nice medium. Let's take a taste. I can't wait to eat this. This is going to be good. Oh, I used enough pepper, that's for sure. It's really good. You can see in the gravy here, the peppers and all the spices I use coming through. I cut it with a knife, but you almost cut it with a fork. I mean, it's coming apart. Yeah, I think this is a winner. Let's go to the outro. 
So I really hope you enjoy uh, watching my video and maybe cook this for yourself at home. Like I said, it's really easy. Um, people do ask me once in a while like when I make stuff, how, what's the best way to reheat it? Um, the way I do it is I just put it in an air fryer at 300, 350 for about, uh, I don't know, maybe five minutes. Uh, if you don't have an air fryer, that's okay. You can put it in your regular oven at about 350 for about five minutes. Make sure your oven's preheated first, though, because if, if it's not preheated and you put it in there, in there it's going to mess up the breading. Uh, what else can I tell you? Uh, the gravy, you saw the white gravy I just taught you how to make. You can use any kind of gravy you want. I mean, if you want to cheat and get those little packets of, of the country gravy or the brown gravy, you're going to get the jarred gravy. It's all good. It's, it's all what you want to do. Um, I've had people tell me on this dish, oh, you know, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. There is no wrong. If it's something you think you might like, hey, give it a try. You never know. You know, it, it make, make it to your own taste. Like, I, I like the pepper gravy. Some people don't like the pepper gravy. Um, you, know, you might want a more beefy gravy, so throw some Gravy Master in there and make a beef gravy with no cream. Uh, it's all your choice. That's what's good about cooking. There's no rules that say this gravy has to go with this dish. I don't believe in that. If it tastes good, heck, you could even try cheese sauce on that. I bet you it would be good. If you could make like a Mornay sauce with some cheddar cheese sauce. Oh, I think that, you know, I might, I have some in the fridge. I might reheat that and try it. But anyway, thanks for watching my video, and I will catch you later. I uh, don't know what's coming up next. I do these videos when I have time. I work a lot now, in the, working in the kitchen, catering, catering, and you know, my eBay store. So I don't have a lot of time to do these. So when I do have time, and my kitchen's clean, um, I'll see what I can come up with next for you. Man, once again, thanks for watching, and do me a favor, hit the like button down there, and subscribe if you haven't subscribed. It helps me along, too. I'm trying to, you know, everybody likes to see likes down there. So, I'll talk to you later. Bye. It's just Bruce. He don't bite. <laughs> Hello.